to all my listeners, whether you're a gold bug or you're concerned about inflation and protecting your capital, you need to check out my brand new conversation with Dan Ferris on the Stansberry Investor Hour podcast out now. You can easily access the episode by clicking the link in this video description box. Hope to see you there. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone and welcome back to Stansberry Research. Back in July of 2021, my guest made a bold prediction that year over year inflation would be at least 6%, 9%, or higher by the end of said year. Well, it turned out he was spot on. So what was the reasoning behind it? He says it was based on extraordinary explosion in the monetary supply. So where do we stand today and where are we headed? Please welcome to my show, Professor Steve Hankey. He is a professor of applied economics for Johns Hopkins University. He's also the former senior economist on the Council of Economic Advisors for President Ronald Reagan. Professor, Good to be reunited back with you. Nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you, Daniela. Uh, want to talk inflation because back in July of 2021, you were already seeing this. You, and I like how you say a lot of times we talk about ad hoc inflation, but really it's a question of monetary supply. Tell us how you came to that conclusion. Okay, you, you, you really have to have, have a right theory of, of how the macro economy works. And, and the right theory is the quantity theory of money. And the, and the way you apply the quantity theory of money is something called the equation of exchange. MV, money times velocity, is equal to PY, which is the, the price level or the inflation rate, times the real level of economic activity or real GDP. So MV equals PY. That, that is the theory of everything. That is the equation of exchange, which is part of the quantity theory of money. And if we go back to the quantity theory of money, by the way, th this is something that it's, it's been around for a long time. If you go back to the 16th century, John Bodin, a, a Frenchman, was probably the first one to formulate the quantity theory of money. And then you had, uh, in the 17th and 18th century, you had David Hume, Richard Cantillon, John Locke. And then we had the 19th century, the, the most famous one uh, was Irving Fisher, but, but maybe, maybe the most famous one was, was actually Simon Newcomb. And Simon Newcomb was a professor of mathematics and astronomy at the Johns Hopkins University, where I am in Baltimore. So then the 20th century will get into something maybe somebody recognizes, and, and that's Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman was a quantity theory of money economist, and he, he was using the equation of exchange. And if you use the equation of exchange, by the way, that MV equals PY, that, that's what's called an, an identity. It, it is true. It must be true. It is an identity. So if you plug the right numbers in to the identity, you, you get the right answer. And John Greenwood and I, in the piece you referred to in the Wall Street Journal in July, we, we said, we, we, we rearranged the, the identity. We, we solved for P, which is the, the rate of inflation, and plugged in the right numbers. And the right numbers were, any way you cut it, inflation by the end of the year, that means last December, we're, we said that it would be 6% or perhaps up to 9%. And that's just, that's that's a story on, on how we got it right first. There were other people talking about inflation was gonna be a problem. Probably the most notable one was Larry Summers, uh, former Secretary of Treasury and Treasury in the United States and professor at Harvard. And Summers was right to be concerned about inflation. He, he had a different reasoning though. He said it was government spending. And he wasn't wrong because government spending, but he wasn't right either. <laughs> so, so the gov government spending, yes, there was a lot of government spending. That government spending was not financed by increased taxes and left us with a deficit. And the US Treasury, of course, sells bonds to finance the deficit. And those bonds are sold to primary dealers in, in, uh, in mostly in New York. And, and then, what happens? Who buys them? Well, the Fed bought a, a great many of them. About 90% of them were bought by the Fed. And that's why this so-called Fed balance sheet expanded and, and the money supply expanded because when the Fed buys 
those bonds from the non-bank private sector, they credit the account of those who are selling the bonds. And what, what's that mean? That means the checking accounts of those recipients that have sold their bonds goes up and checking accounts are part of the money supply. Professor, I wanna bring up a quote uh, to your point and then I'll ask the question and then we'll get to your new forecasts for inflation. But first, here's your quote. I like how you say, the rate of growth in the money supply is swept under the rug in the US. This attitude is comparable to maintaining that the law of gravity applies in every country except the United States. So my question is this, was the Fed, was, was Jerome Powell and company not using that equation when they came up with the term transitory for inflation? Are they sweeping it under the rug? Why wouldn't they be looking at this? Well, they're, they're not even looking at the, for, forget the equation of exchange and the quantity theory of money. They're not even looking at the money supply. <laughs> so, and, and Powell has testified uh, repeatedly that the quant quantity of money has, has become kind of in, irrelevant, disconnected to, to activity in the real economy and, and inflation in particular, which is just not true. I, I, I've just gone back for, to 1960 and, and I've used the quantity theory of money, the equation of exchange to, to forecast what the price level should be in each year. And it matches up perfectly with what, what's, what's going on with inflation. So Milton Friedman, inflation is, always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Now back to Larry Summers, by the way, the, the reason that Summers is kind of right, his conclusion about inflation is 100% right, but his reasoning, he, he's a fiscalist, he's a Keynesian, and he's looking at, at the government expenditures. He's only focused on government expenditures. And, and that's not really the way to go because you can have a huge increase in government expenditures and no inflation if, the increase in government expenditures is financed by taxes, so then you would have no deficit. Or if it's, if it's financed by bonds that, that are sold to the public, but the Fed never intervenes, the Fed never monetizes the bonds. In, in that case, what happens? You sell a bond to somebody and, and somebody has to go to their bank account and send the government a check for the bonds they receive. And that actually tends to reduce the money supply and also increase the interest rates. So, so that's not a that's a non-inflationary thing. It's not an inflationary thing. The key to the government fiscal side of things, and the reason, and the only reason that it causes inflation is because the Fed steps in and buys the bonds. It monetizes the deficit, and and it is a money supply. You see, it's always the money supply. You have to look at the amount of money held in the hands of the general public. That is what makes things go around. And I, I know you can't get into the head of Fed Chair Jerome Powell, Professor, but why is he discounting the money supply aspect? Why do you think? Well, there, there are actually two, two fundamental reasons. One is that Macroeconomics, the way it's taught uh, every place in the world, it's, it's essentially post-Keynesian modeling. And when I say post-Keynesian, those models don't have money in the model. So everyone is trained in such a way, or most people, that they don't, they're, they're, they're not aware of what we're talking about. They're not aware of money because it's not in the models. What is in the models is interest rates. So, so that's, one, that's one reason. The second reason, is that for a number of years, it, it's been very fashionable to spend a lot of time talking about the Taylor rule. And the so-called Taylor rule it was John Taylor, a very, very distinguished economist at Stanford University, came up with the Taylor rule. And the Taylor rule basically says that to meet the inflation target of the Fed, you've got to change the federal funds rate in a certain way to follow the so-called Taylor rule. But, but it doesn't talk about the money supply. It's talking about interest rates. It's the sa same thing as the post-Keynesian model. So for those two reasons, the Fed and all central bankers, they look at interest rates now, but it's the money supply, stupid, that makes everything happen. Not interest rates, it's the money supply. So to that point, uh, we, we know about how the Fed 
you know, plans to uh, taper its assets purchases, purchases over the next six months. But you right, if the Fed succeeds in bringing the M2 growth down slowly and gradually to five to 6% year on year, the outcome could be benign. Such a deceleration of money growth would simply result in a slowdown of nominal GDP in 2023, 2024. However, if FOMC members start to lose patience on account of the persistence of above target inflation and raise interest rates suddenly and steeply, the sell-off in financial markets could be painful and the risks of a recession in 2023 or 2024 would rise substantially. So two points here. Um, how does this play out? What's, you know, we're talking about four interest rate hikes this year. First of all, do you, do you believe that narrative? There, there is a risk that the inflation will really get under the hide of the Fed and they'll panic and, and they'll start squeezing things too, too fast. And if, if that happens, we could have a recession. We will still have the inflation, but we, we'd actually have a recession too. That, that's, that is, is, a, is a possibility. The most likely scenario, let me, let me give you the ideal scenario. The ideal scenario, if I was running things, right now, M2, the measure of money, that's the broadest one the Fed calculates, is growing at 13.1% per year. Now, that is about twice as fast, or a little over twice as fast as it should be growing if they wanted to hit their inflation target at 2%. So what I would do, I would, as fast as I can, reduce the growth rate in M2 from 13.1% down to about 6%. If they did that, what would happen using, again, the quantity theory of money? Right. We, we have had the following buildup since COVID. M2 has actually grown by 40% since February of 2020. So think of a bathtub and, and the, 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 the money is going through the faucet in, into the bathtub and, and the total increase of the money in the bathtub has been 40, it's 40% greater than it was in February of 2020. And then the bathtub has a couple of drains in it. That money drains out to accommodate real economic activity. So that's one drain. And the second drain is that there are increases in the demand for money. People want to hold more money they're, 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 as the GDP gets bigger, as their incomes get bigger. That total drainage out of those two drains is about 25% of the 40% increase. So that means that about 30% of the cumulative increase since February 2020 is left in the tub. So what happens to that? That eventually goes out the overflow valve as inflation. That's where inflation comes from. It's the excess money that's been created. And there's a lag, a variable lag that occurs that, that runs about 12 months to 24 months. So it's just starting the excess to drain out of the tub now. And so you said, well, what's your inflation forecast? If the Fed would reduce the growth rate down from 13.1 to 6%, and, and we end up, up, the drain overflow goes out, we, we would have inflation just in that scenario, yeah. in that best world scenario of, of 6% or more to, for 2022, 2023, into 2024. So, so that's why inflation is, is permanent. It's not temporary because it, it takes a long time, this lag between the injection of excess money into the system before it actually starts draining out and spreading out over the economy. That said, so if inflation is going to be sticking around in our lives for, for, for quite a while here, um, are there sectors that you prefer? I, mean, I'm not, you know, I know you don't give financial advice, but if as an investor, what is one to do here? Let's put it this way. What you should have done, looking back to the start of February 2020, when this big surge started and, and anticipating that they were going to keep the surge on, what happens, you, you have a, the following sequence, monetary sequence with a quantity theory of money. The surge of money begins, and about one to nine months later, asset prices go up. So they did. The stock market boom, housing prices boom, commodity prices boom immediately. 
Then with a lag of about six to 18 months, the real economy starts kicking in. Okay, we, we've seen that. We, we, we had a huge slump and boom, I came back with a huge V in, in, the, in the real economy and, and, and that's moving along. And then we've got the inflation, 12, 24 months. So we've still got the inflation with us. You wanna be in commodities in general. You, you wanna be completely away from nominal bonds of any kind because interest rates follow the inflation rate. And the inflation rate is gonna be permanent. It's going, it's going up. You wait and see, we're gonna get an inflation number yet this week and it'll be higher than 7.1%, which is the last one we had, the last month's reading that we had. And so in that case, the, the bond market is gonna be under tremendous pressure and the bond market is very mispriced because the bond market actually, even today, the inflation rate is 7.1%, but for the next year, the bond market has an inflation rate priced in at about 3.5%, and then they have it falling. In 2023 and 2024, they have the thing going down to 2 2.5%. So, so the, the market is completely mispriced because the market participants think the same way the Fed does. They've all been trained the same way with these post Keynesian models. They all lap up whatever the Fed says, they, they believe it obviously, right. because the markets are pretty much in line with the Fed. The markets are saying to Paul, we trust you. We think you're, we think you're gonna turn the dial and get inflation under control in the, in the near future. And we're not very worried about it. And I'm saying, no, if you go to the quantity theory and run the numbers, you, you've got a tremendous inflation problem, persistent, that's going to be facing us. And the bond markets right. will eventually pivot, by the way. They always do. Because bond interest rates, long-term rates, I'm talking about things with duration of two years or more, always follow inflation. They don't lead it. They follow it. Okay, that's really interesting, Professor, because... I had a lot of experts coming on saying if the Fed were to aggressively fight inflation, um, that that ultimately would turn into turmoil for uh, the U.S. stock market, that we'd have a you know a huge correction, crash, et cetera. Uh, but you're saying not so. Well, now the stock market, I, I was talking about commodities being very, very bullish on commodities and very bearish on nominal bonds. That's the only thing I said. The, the other experts, okay, the stock market turmoil, that will come when the bond market turmoil that I think will happen, happens. And when the bond, when the, when the bond really start tanking, believe me, the stock market is not gonna be silent. It, it will, the multiples will come off the stock market and we'll see a pretty big correction in the stock market. Let's 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 focus on commodities a second, specifically gold. I know we've had conversations at length in the past on the topic of the yellow metal. Is or make the case uh, for gold being a great inflation fighter? Well, it hasn't gone down, but it hasn't it hasn't done much. I think there's a I think there's a good bull leg in in, in gold, uh, and we'll see it coming as we see turmoil in the bond market and, and persistent inflation. I'm not worried about it. I'm long gold, so I'm not worried about it. It doesn't bother me at all. But there are other things that are very interesting that are more exotic, like lithium. Lithium is skyrocketed, and that's something you want to be long. Now, this is not inflation per se. This, this is a relative price change problem. In other words, if you look at the, com if you look at the composition of a of a price index and you've got hundreds of items in a, in a price index and the, and the price index goes up and down and that is because of money and changes in the money supply. That's why big indices go up, go down, go up and go down. Inside the basket, you've got hundreds of items and you've got relative price changes going on inside the basket. And, and, and lithium and, and the commodities would be places where you would see this relative price change going on. Oil prices, for example, they've gone up and been very strong recently. Well, that's a relative price change. They've been going up relative to everything else in the basket. Lithium is, is through the roof. Oil, oil is very strong. So you have a distribution of things in the basket. And when, when we started 
seeing the basket itself go up, 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 originally only a few items in the basket were increasing in price. That's the relative prices. The relative prices were going up. And now we see almost everything in the basket's going up. There, there are almost nothing, no, no sectors of the economy do we see prices actually going down. Very few, very tiny. And that, and that is just a symptom of all the prices, the relative prices shifting around, all of them going up in absolute terms. And when that happens, of course, the basket goes up. But, but what drives that basket going up, that aggregate basket going up, it's the money supply and the equation of exchange. That's, that's, where, the, that's where the inflation comes from, not, not relative price change. Now, now to get this, Danielle, to just so your viewers have an idea of what I'm talking about, all this supply side talk we see is just utter nonsense as it relates to inflation, because supply chains don't have anything to do with inflation. They have something to do with the supply in a particular market of a particular thing and changes in relative prices. But if you look at countries where they have low inflation, like China, Japan, Switzerland, I mean, Switzerland and Japan, the inflation rates less than 1%. <laughs> it's around a little over 2% in China. All of those countries have all the supply chain problems we have, but they don't have inflation. And they don't have inflation because the money supply isn't growing excessively. So, so, so if you read the press, you, you have to remember my 95% rule on reading the financial press. 95% of what you read in the financial press is either wrong or irrelevant. And, and everything you read about inflation has some story with it about COVID, supply chain, some, nothing about money, by the way. Point made, Professor. Absolutely. The, the first major newspaper that even got in, uh, into this was last weekend. David Lynch at the Washington Post had an article in, in which he, he's at, he asked some of the same questions that you're posing. Not, not we, the article didn't go into it as much detail, but it's the first major news source that I'm aware of in which money was even discussed. Well, that's what we're, we're aiming to do. So what I want to do is educate the audience, equip them with the, with the right knowledge, the, with the right tools. And um, if I may, uh, maybe we can just wrap with your thoughts on crypto. I know you've been very critical of the space. I just want to read one of your recent tweets. 323 million in crypto was stolen from a blockchain bridge called Wormhole, making it, um, I believe, now the fourth largest crypto heist ever. Uh, that's no surprise. Crypto is a paradise for crooks and thieves. I had Lynn Alden on uh, recently, and she was saying that when you know we had the China crackdown, we had the Nigeria crackdown, which really didn't do much to move the needle on Bitcoin. But if uh, the U.S., for example, were to step in and start regulating uh uh, cryptocurrencies that could be a huge game changer i'd like to hear from you your thoughts in terms of regulation is it coming anytime soon oh well it, it, it's coming the question is what form that it should come because right now the crypto space the, the producers of cryptos they're they're banks they're, they're producing money like a about 90 percent of all the broad money produced in the united states dollars dollars is produced by commercial banks. It's not produced by the Fed. It's produced by commercial banks privately. So most people don't understand. Most dollars produced in the United States are actually produced privately by private commercial banks. And cryptos are, these tokens are money. And they're produced by, in effect, de facto banks. But they're outside the law. So the rule of law is not being applied. They're exempt from it. And the rule of law should be applied. If you, if you walk like a duck and you quack like a duck, you are a duck. So if you behave like a bank and sound like a bank, you're a bank. And you should be incorporated under the regulatory regimes that, that we have in the United States. You should, you should be regulated like everybody else. If you're not, then the rule of law is not applicable in the United States. Now, what they're trying to, so that, that's my thing. They're banks, so you just regulate them like banks. And we, we have all the regulation, all this nonsense that it's some new innovation cryptos. No, they're, they're some technical aspects of blockchain and the crypto aspect might be new, but, but what they're doing is not new at all. The point is, 
they, they will be regulated. How should they be regulated? I think they should be regulated just like everybody else. If they're issuing securities and the SEC regulates them and some of what they're doing really falls under the issuance of debt. If they're doing what a bank does, then they're regulated like banks. The end, that's the end of the story. What the cryptos want, they, they want special treatment and special regulations. And of course, they're trying to bamboozle the regulators in Washington and the politicians and spending millions of dollars doing it so that they can get a special deal. So, so they're, they're engaging in what's called regulatory arbitrage. Let me ask you, would there ever be a situation in the future, which like if we were to get more regulation or any kind of regulation in this in this space, that would make you reconsider the cryptocurrency space. Do you see any value there? Oh, there, uh, there, I think there's no question. We're 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 going to have cryptos. They're not they're not going away. And 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 right now we're we're in the early stages of of the development of this digitized space, shall we say. What form it takes, I, I, I really, it's hard to anticipate. It depends, by the way, on what we're talking about, the form of regulation that, it, that it's imposed and the, the, the kind of rule of law that they have to live under. But, but right now, my, a lot of my criticism of cryptos uh, is, is the, the fact that they are really outlaws. I mean, it's outside the law. That's, that's one aspect. The other aspect is that their behavior is such that they're so extremely volatile that it, it is a speculative asset. It's really, they're not used as units of account or, or currencies. It's more like going into a casino. So people have to know if, you know, if you want to go to the casino, I'm a classical liberal. I'm, I'm not going to stop somebody from going into a casino and gambling. If they want to do that, but they have to know what they're doing. I mean, they're gambling. That, that's what's that's what's going on in the crypto space right now, and and for those who've who've, who've you know the greater fools theory if if they if they bought 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 low and found a fool to sell a thing too high, fine good for them. I happen to think, by the way, with regard to Bitcoin itself, that there will be competitive cryptos that come in that are much superior, and, and eventually I think that the fundamental value of Bitcoin is zero. There's, there's no valuation model for any currency that can be used to, to place a value on it. I think the fundamental value is zero. Now, the, that's not the market value. The, object, the objective market value is, is, is a positive number. I haven't looked at it today, so I, I can't give you the reading on it, but, but the objective value is is what the market price is. The, the subjective valuation, I think, is in my view as an analyst, is zero. So, so the question is, well, when, when, when will a market value approach this, my subjective value? I have no clue when that's going to happen. But the process by which it'll happen is, is as follows. There will be superior cryptos entering the market, and, and they will eventually push aside Bitcoin. And it, it'll be a, a historical relic. Maybe its fundamental value will be something a little greater than zero because you can put it in a museum and people will pay to go see it. All good thoughts, Professor. I hope to continue this conversation with you soon. I know you're extremely busy, so I appreciate your time today to speak with us. Great to be with you, Daniela. Good. Have a good day. Good to be reunited with you as well, Professor. And thank you all for watching. We'll have much more for you, so be sure to stay tuned to Stansberry Research. And don't forget to sign up for premier content you can't get anywhere else at DanielaCamboni.com. That's it for me. Thank you for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.